Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Takedown, our series of unfiltered conversations about tobacco and advocacy within communities most impacted by the tobacco industry. My name is Lori Rubiner, and today we are joined by LaFonza Butler, who last fall became Emily List, Emily's List third president, the first woman of color and the first mother to lead the organization. LaFonza brings a wealth of experience as a union leader, organizer, and political strategist, and she has taken charge of Emily's List at a critical juncture for the organization and women in politics. LaFonza, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on The Takedown. Thanks for having me, Lori. I'm really excited to be a part of it. So first, um, congratulations on becoming the third president of Emily's List. And on behalf of all women who care deeply about preserving abortion rights, we are just all so grateful that you've taken on this role at such a challenging time. Can you share with us a little bit about why you decided this was the best step for you and how the first couple of months have been for you? Sure. Um, you know, this is um, indeed a challenging time. Um, I think President Biden referred to it uh, and Vice President Harris referred to it as an inflection point. Um, and my work in the labor movement really was always about thinking about the next phase, about bringing working people together to build power in their communities and to create change. Um, and thinking about how to sustain it over the long term. And I always say that one of the most valuable lessons I learned about political organizing, I learned from my mom at home, not because we talked about politics or candidates um, at our dinner table, uh, because we really didn't. Uh, I saw her struggle. Uh, I saw how hard she worked um, to be a working mom with three children and, you know, taking care of my father who had heart disease. And you know, she did work multiple jobs doing that. And I'm always thinking about how to reach women like her um, who are so talented, who are so committed to service uh, and making uh, their communities better and, and stronger. And, and thinking about what needs to happen for women like my mom to build political power um, in their communities. And, and that's ultimately, um, how we get to real lasting change. Um, as someone who's, you know, really has spent my entire career empowering women, working um, with uh, women who worked as security officers or teachers or uh, nursing home workers, I really am excited to continue that work as the head of an organization that has fundamentally changed the face of American politics at every level. Emily's List next chapter, I think is gonna be about expanding our base um, from members and donors to our candidates and to our, our voters, making sure that young women uh, and women of every color and community language and background are able to bring their political engagement to Emily's List um, and doing that together uh, in the spirit of my mom in the spirit of the women who I learned so much from uh, in, the, in the labor movement uh, and in the spirit of, of the you know, past nearly 40 years of Emily's List, doing what it takes to do it together uh, and, and to win. And so the last few months have been an exciting journey uh, in learning the um, complexity of, of Emily's List. It's not just an organization that works to help candidates raise money. It is an, organiza an organization that helps candidates at every level. Women who are thinking about running for office um, really put together those campaigns. If you could imagine, Lori, if you're a teacher who, who wants to run for, for city council or, or, or for your local school board, you don't really know how to find a campaign manager um, or to find a fundraising director, or what even that may be. And so um, I've spent a lot of time um, really learning more about um, what women candidates need from Emily's List and then how we can make those types of services and supports um, accessible um, to a broader uh, group of women all across the country and getting to know the existing Emily's List community. You don't join a 40 year organization uh, and sort of you know, just jump right into it. There have been people who have been working uh, incredibly hard over many decades. Uh, and so learning, but also meeting this incredibly important moment um, with this organization, helping to recruit candidates like you know, Sherry Beasley and, 
and Val Demings uh, mm -hmm. engaging with with the leaders like Karen Bass, who, who, who's running for mayor of Los Angeles. And so it really has been a great few first few months. And I'm excited about uh, the work ahead uh, and fully aware of the challenges uh, we have in front of us. Well, you've named some of our um, heroines, um, Karen Bass among them, who's been such a great supporter of our issues, Val Demings, um, just, you know, a wonderful inspiration. And you are a real inspiration, LaFonza. Um, so uh, just pivoting to your previous roles and experience with um, the Service Employees International Union, I mean, you bring a real unique perspective about advocacy through the lens of workers' rights. What are some of the most valuable advocacy lessons you learn from your work as a labor organizer? And are there ways that you're going to bring those lessons to apply to the work of Emily's List? That's a really, really good question, Lori. You know, I started at SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, two weeks after I graduated from college. Um, and one of the things that I learned about just the craft of being an organizer uh, is the most important skill you can have is being a good listener. Um, and the most effective organizers I know are those who listen, um, not just think about what is the next thing that they're gonna say, but really um, take in um, what is being communicated to them and, and with them. And so one of the things that, that I want to um, apply to, to Emily's list is the skill of listening. Um, and you know, for I think the storied history of Emily's list, we have demonstrated that we're listening to women who want to offer themselves uh, as public servants. Um, and we also now need to be um, real listeners to the communities that those women come from, um, helping them to shape campaigns that speak to that constituency whose trust, not just their vote, but whose trust they're looking to earn. And so uh, I think that a government is only truly representative um, of its people when it's listening to them. And I wanna make sure that Emily's List is, is a, really a part of reflecting back um, what it is that we are, that we are hearing and, and that we're learning. And so throwing the doors of Emily's List wide open again to, to women who may have thought that their journey is not one that is suitable for public office. I want to make sure that Emily's List um, reaches out and, and is really proximate in those communities who, who have thought that um, women in, in who are on their street, um, who make a difference every single day on their block, um, aren't capable of making a difference uh, in a government context. And I want to change uh, those norms. I want to make make it such that Emily's List is the home for every woman who who really want to offer themselves. And key to that, um, in my opinion, is being a good organizer. Um, and being a good organizer really is steep in being a high quality listener. That's a that's a good lesson probably for everybody. I think especially <laughs> right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> So one of the reasons, LaFonza, we were really interested in talking with you today is to get your advice about how to organize and fight back against an industry that has targeted communities that you really do care about and have um, spent a long time fighting for. You know, the tobacco industry has used some of the most pernicious marketing tactics to target women, girls, and minority communities. And they, unfortunately, they've been really successful at it. Um, and meanwhile, the vaping industry, which is an offshoot of the tobacco industry, has their sights set on young people with thousands of flavored e-cigarettes. Um, and having, so having worked in the labor movement against big industries, are there any insights you can share with us and with our viewers and our supporters about how to fight back against these big industries that target um, vulnerable communities and advocate effectively? You know, I, I, the, the, uh, the advice I would offer probably is, is twofold. And, and I was a part of a coalition and took on a tobacco industry in, in the state of California. And it's um, pernicious tactics um, that that you referenced, and you know, one of the things that was um, so important to to our strategy um, was not assuming that the industries were the only ones who were powerful. 
Mm -hmm. um, recognizing the power within our coalition, recognizing um, the power within these communities. Um, and not only the, the, the sort of collective power that we had together, but, but what we could actually do um, as the African-American community, as the uh, Latino community, as the Asian community, that together we had the power and could build the resources to take on these special interests and these and the industries. And so we started, had to really start from a place of accepting and understanding that we ourselves had power to utilize to go up against these companies. And then we weren't just, um, I, we didn't just have to sit back and take what they were pushing into, into our communities. And one of the most important things um, to know is that, you know, it's, it's really that it's possible. Um, and uh, uh, in appreciating your, our own power, knowing that it's possible and seeing examples of winning um, is I think really, really important uh, as, as well. Um, and so as we, as, you know, uh, we move forward and continue to take on big industries uh, like tobacco and vaping and, and challenging the tactics that they are using and targeting these, these communities, recognizing our own power, choosing to do it together, because it is a fundamental choice and a strategic choice um, to do it uh, in coalition and in partnership, and appreciating that, that you know, all, even if you don't win the war, there is value in winning the battles along the way. Interesting. Um, I read an interview you did with Marie Claire recently where you spoke about the lessons learned from your time as a senior advisor for then Senator Kamala Harris, now vice president. And you talked about the impact of misinformation and disinformation, something that the anti-choice movement um, has been very good at doing. Um, and it's, a, it's also a huge problem with the tobacco control movement. Um, what are some tips and advice you give to candidates and campaigns to effectively manage those kinds of attacks? It's a great question. And, you know, obviously, this is a huge problem. Uh, and it's something that as the president of Emily's List, I'm really working hard to make sure our candidates and their campaigns are prepared for, both in terms of being equipped to fight back um, from within their campaigns, but also making sure that they know that we have their backs and understand that doing well, we're doing everything that we can to help counter the huge volume of misinformation and disinformation uh, that is out there. One of the biggest things that I feel like um, is important to note uh, is that even with good intentions, uh, sometimes we are we participate in the proliferation of this information. Um, we we will quote tweet something or we will you know link to something, uh, and what we're doing is being a part of spreading it, and so low-hanging fruit uh, tip uh, and, and advice uh, that we try to make sure is, is in front of mind for our candidates is like, is don't, re don't spread it, yeah. uh, <laughs> don't, don't participate in it. And, the, and that the, the, the best and strongest ways to counter misinformation is with positive content. We have to remind voters of the great work that we're doing um, as, uh, as a community uh, and how we are choosing to stand and, and work together. And I think getting that positive contact out there, content out there is one of the best and most effective ways that we found in our research for countering that misinformation. So don't spread it um, and get positive messaging out. That's a really important point. Um... So as a mother, and you talk a lot about, I've read a bunch of your interviews, you talk a lot about your daughter. Um, I'm also the mother of a daughter, much older. Um, but in someone who got started in politics at a young age, and now someone who works closely with a lot of young people who are passionate about women's rights and abortion rights, you understand better than anyone the role that young people have to impact and shape policies and movements that they care about. So in your view, what is the role for young people in progressive movements and what are some of the best ways that they can get involved? And I, I have to say, like, I, I just think right now it is so hard with young people because there's so many existential threats um, that they're facing, um, you know, abortion rights, climate, guns, tobacco, um, you know, how do you get them to 
get engaged, stay engaged when there are so many things, COVID, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, Laura, I think those of us who are older <laughs> make the assumption that they are not engaged. Um, and so I think for some of us, we have to appreciate that engagement might look differently for this generation of young activists. Um, that engagement for them might mean, you know, tweeting with to their friends or doing an Instagram story or um, doing Clubhouse. Like, I think that we have to appreciate that engagement and how that looks evolves. Um, and, and being open to that evolution, I think is important for the um, uh, multi for cross generations to be able to come together and find value in the way that each of us do it. Um, the way that that my generation, you know, defined engagement looks very different than the way that Gen Z may define engagement, and both of them are okay. Mm -hmm. So I start from that place. I also think it's important for our young activists. Um, to know that they, they really can get involved at any age. And I, I think that is also very apparent, whether we're watching uh, young, uh, you know, six and seven year olds uh, collect their, you know, save their lunch money to pay for the lunch of, of, of their, their uh, classmates who may not be able to afford it, or we're watching uh, young people have um, do food drives for others in their communities. I think we're seeing that this is a generation of, of young activists who know that they have power and agency um, when they decide that they have power and agency and that they're going to, to utilize it. I think it's also important to understand that our everyday life, um, has really been impacted by the laws and policies, um, by those perspectives that are at the decision-making table. And so for young people, I think, you know, some of the best ways to get them involved from an organizational point of view is make space for them to be at the decision-making tables. I think they will engage. Mm -hmm. I think they will participate. They, will, they are showing us that they are prepared to meet this moment. And we who have been around for a, a little bit longer um, think that there's one way um, or the way that we know um, to do things. And I think making space for, for them intentionally and including their voices intentionally will make a big difference in, in how they show up and how they stay involved. One final question before we let you go, and I mean, I could sit and listen to you all day, but I know you have other much more important things to do. Um, so for advocates and people at home, I mean, they see the news every day and it may be tough at times to find a lot of optimism. So are there, what are some things to be hopeful about as we head into 2022 and especially approaching the midterms, which don't feel great right now? Um, <laughs> what are some things that are, you're feeling optimistic about, LaFonza? Yeah, you know, the first thing that I would say to, to those folks who are you know, really are seeing the, seeing the news reports every day and feeling a little down um, is I would offer them the advice that I offer to myself every single day from one of our nation's, you know, most storied fighters um, uh, in, in probably in, the, in not only in our nation, but in the world. And Muhammad Ali said when he was fighting his biggest battle, um, uh, 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 he said, uh, don't count the days, make the days count. And so as we watch the news and as we feel a little bit down, we do have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to make every moment count? Um, and at Emily's list right now, I am excited about and optimistic about the incredibly powerful, diverse, visionary bunch of candidates that we've uh, ever seen uh, in American politics. We talked about some of them uh, earlier, but you know, to add on, you, you think about like a Rochelle Garza, who's running for uh, attorney general in, in Texas. You think about Jocelyn Benson and her advocacy as secretary of state and work to protect the ballot um, for, um, for folks in Michigan, but, but really for all over the country. It is incredibly inspiring to see these women 
leave it all out um, on the field to protect the idea of America's democracy. And to me, that's a reason for great, great optimism that, that while it is hard, no one has given up um, and that the endless list candidates are every day working to make sure that they are making every day count. Well, you are an inspiration, um, LaFonza Butler, and it is a real joy to have had this opportunity to talk with you. I, I really am grateful for the time you have taken, and I am grateful for the work you are doing at Emily's List. Um, please make sure to follow LaFonza Butler, Emily's List, and Tobacco Free Kids on social media. All our handles will be in the description below. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, we will be watching you carefully. I'm glad to have you and thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work of Tobacco Free Kids. You, you all are saving generations with every moment. And so we really appreciate the work. Thank you, LaFonza. Thank you.